Hello everyone and welcome back to Brick Cats. Today I am reviewing Fukusaku's TIE Fighter, which he released in May of 2022. As always, please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment, or supporting what I do in any other way you see fit. I greatly appreciate it. The TIE Fighter needs little introduction and appears in various forms throughout the original trilogy era as the Empire's basic space superior V space fighter. It's mostly known for being deployed in large numbers to overwhelm opponents' defenses, and its lack of a hyperdrive ties it to a carrier vessel like a Star Destroyer or local planetary defense. Running the vanilla parts list through Bricklink gave me 5 stores and $231 before shipping and tax, or about $271 including shipping and tax. Ultimately, I was able to get this down to around $195 including shipping and tax. In my reviews, I offer my opinions on aesthetics and model features, parts issues you might want to look out for, the build experience, the model's integrity, and I close out with my overall impression and pricing information in the conclusion. I assume you've bought the instructions or are interested in buying them, and I also ba assume a basic level of familiarity with Bricklink's ordering system and LEGO nomenclature. I only use genuine LEGO bricks and I always purchase the instructions. I create these reviews for my own personal enjoyment, and in the hopes that my advice will make your experience more enjoyable and or less expensive. Fukusaku's TIE Fighter measures 10 inches tall sitting on its wings, 8.75 inches wide, and 8.25 inches deep. The include stand brings the height measurement to about 12.25 inches, and I'm not going to do the review on the stand for reasons I'll get to later. For those of us with real measurement systems, or those of you with real measurement systems that is, that's about 25.4 centimeters tall on its wings and 31.1 centimeters tall on the stand, by 22.2 centimeters wide and 21 centimeters deep. This gives it a height-to-width ratio of about 1.14, which is pretty similar to Wikipedia's measurements of 7.5 by 6.4 meters, which gives a ratio of 1.17, but this is also moderately less than Wikipedia's measurements of 8.8 .8 by 6.7 meters, or a ratio of 1.31. Wikipedia's measurements happen to be the same as the TIE Fighter Owner's Manual, which is apparently fully authorized and approved by Lucasfilm. Regardless of the exact dimensions, in my opinion, the proportions of this TIE Fighter look perfectly fine, and I don't immediately get the sense that the model is too wide or too short. And there's lots of ambiguity in the measurements anyways, as the ILM models were often different from one to the next, and there have been, there have been several iterations of the TIE Fighter model, and apparently the TIE Fighter dimensions, depending on where you look. The cockpit eyeball shape is defined mostly by the 3x3x2 round corner bricks, and the designer constructed the cockpit to be 9 studs wide, and this does leave plenty of room for the cockpit to, or for the pilot to sit in the cockpit, excuse me. And there's a nice assortment of scopes and controls in there, as well as some trans red detailing that is a little bit hard to see with the light here. You can kind of just make it out in the back there. The nozzle pieces underneath the cockpit windscreen, they don't quite fit in my model, which I found a little bit strange because they worked just fine in the interceptor by Fukusaku, but the the edges of or the ends of the no nozzle pieces kind of bump up against the 3x2 round corner brick, and it kind of tilts the cannons upwards a little bit. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, uh, probably just me, but it's not that big of a deal and you can't really notice it. The printed dish on the top here is specified, but of course this can be changed out with the plain one, and Fukusaku actually notes this in the rebrickable notes. And moving further down the back, the twin ion engines are nicely done with these 1x1 red plates, um, with only the studs showing because of the dark blue gray neck bracket right there. Fukusaku also points out that the 5x5 dish right here that you see in dark bluish gray uh, would probably look better in light bluish gray, but that one happens to be quite expensive, so I've used the dark bluish gray version here. And using this boat stud piece and the, the dish pieces here, 
doesn't give it the most accurate shape that I think uh, is, is possible, but it does get the job done in the shoes pieces, and this black void here is supposed to be like a, a trapezoidal shape. The wing pylons either side of the cockpit are fairly simple, but convey the basic shape, and I really like the use of these dagger pieces and the bar with clip pieces here to, to give the little fin structure like that. And looking at it from head on, it gives the, the nice basic shape of taper down to the wing connection there. The outer edge of the wings are covered in the 1x2 grill tiles to give them some texture, and I absolutely love how these look. It's basically the best representation of the TIE Fighter solar panels that I've seen in a TIE Fighter model. And they create, uh, well of course, the accurate texture lines, and they don't add too much extra thickness. The interior side of the wings, uh, I'll show you this side. It's the majority of the 2x2 inverted tiles here, which are smooth. And then there's some necessary anti-studs with the wedge pieces and uh, some of these modified plates here. The light bluish gray segments that you can see making the spokes, they cover the uh, gaffs just fine. And these four diagonal spokes are secured at both ends, while the horizontal segments here are not. So the side effect there, in addition to catching cat hair, these don't sit as close to the edge as I might like, but again, it's not that noticeable. And then of course the outer edge of the wing is the standard tile and clifford bar connections. And finally on the bottom, I've seen it pop off a couple times, there is another 6x6 dish connected with a Technic Axle to round out the bottom there. In closing, I think Fukusaku's TIE Fighter is an excellent looking model. The grill tiles on the wings look incredible, and like I said, this is I think the only TIE Fighter at this scale that makes extensive use of them. So that alone makes this very display worthy, and the rest of the model looks excellent as well. Fukusaku's TIE Fighter requires 157 elements and 1,742 pieces. The designer has helpfully noted two significant substitutions in the Revicable Details page. The first is the cockpit windscreen, specified as part 18675PB09, and this is the older version and has slightly more details on the print on the grey section here. Fukusaka recommends switching this out for the newer version, part 18675PB02, and this is the one that is found on the 2021 TIE Fighter. Um, and it has slightly less detail on the printed section here, but otherwise it's the same trans black. And might as well put this here for scale. Um, I actually had a couple of the 2021 uh, TIE Fighter dishes. Sorry, they're not 2021, they were used in a couple of other sets, but um, so I just use that. And you can see there's no, no compromise in appearance there. Of course, the second is switching out the printed top dish, that's part 18675PB01 for the plain version, part 18675 in light bluish gray. If you've got this printer dish from Vader's TIE Advance versus A-Wing, I think that's part, uh, set 75150, or from a previous TIE mock, then it looks great, but the plain dish certainly isn't bad by any means. The tile round 2x2 with bottom stud holder with black Star Wars TIE Fighter pattern, part 14679PB025, can be randomly expensive, so make sure you know what you're paying for this. It's worth it to try substituting part 4150PB086, which is the older tile, otherwise the model doesn't look terrible leaving this part out entirely, or with a dark bluish gray round tile, just plain part 4150. Like I mentioned earlier, the dish 5x5 in dark bluish gray, part 6942, is moderately expensive, usually around $2. Light bluish gray is even more expensive on average. And in my opinion, you can lim eliminate this dish entirely by substituting the 4L bar in the back for 
the newer bar 2L with stop ring, part 68258 in any color, and then substituting a black 2x2 round tile part 4150 for the black 2x2 boat stud, which is part 2654. This will cost you some accuracy, as the rear of the fighter will be too round, but if cost is an issue, you can definitely consider it. And this dark bluish gray uh, dish is also not that common, so you might even reduce your sword count by one. The two cone 1 and 1 6 by 1 and 1 6 by 2 thirds, the Fez piece, part 85975 in dark red. These are completely hidden in the final build, obviously taking the top off to show you, but uh, if you're the kind of person that is only building this for display, uh, in my opinion these can be eliminated. The lone Technic Pin 3L, part 6558 in black, works just as well in the more common blue. And I alluded this to this a bit in the first section, but in my opinion, the stand is not necessary for this TIE Fighter. So if you're not interested in building the stand, you can eliminate the following elements. And aside from all of the elements I've already mentioned, the rest of the parts are fairly standard. However, the following will likely be less expensive direct from LEGO's pick brick service. And with pick brick, if you spend more than $14 on bestsellers, and standard pieces, the uh, handling fees are waived, and the handling fees are $3.50 for bestsellers and $7 for pick and brick standard pieces. And note that your order is automatically going to be divided between bestsellers and standard, so you have to meet the $14 threshold in each category. Orders that total over $35 ship for free, so that's really nice. So that means the more you buy from LEGO, the greater your chances of reducing your Bricklink store count are as well, so you basically eliminate two shipping charges, which can save you uh, probably about $15 total. This build took me about four hours without any appreciable sorting. The light blue stray parts do blend together a bit, but it's not that difficult to pick out the parts from the pile. And the large quantities of pieces like the 400 some odd 1x2 grill tiles and the I think it's 148 2x2 inverted tiles are handy to group together just to keep out of the way. Each piece or subassembly to be added in each step is highlighted in red, and I didn't run into any viewing angle problems or other ambiguities in the instructions. There were two steps that I had a lot of difficulties with, both involving the wings. And these wings, once you get them together, like I said, they look incredible, but uh, getting there is a little bit of a journey. The first step I had trouble with was when you first add these interior spokes. These are actually not connected by really traditional connection, so Fuku Fukusaku has you adding them in and then slotting the two wing sections into place. Um, so these are just kind of floating, uh, not connected to anything, and I found it pretty difficult to, to get these to stay where they're supposed to. You can add these afterwards. The, the interesting connection with uh, the diagonal spokes is that there is a tap piece down here that provides some anchoring at the far end, if you will. So you can insert the wing sections and then kind of wiggle the tap piece into place and then connect the diagonal spoke here and slot it in right here. Like I said, it takes a little bit of finesse, but I think that's a better way to do it, because otherwise you're just going to have this subassembly times four times the other wing just kind of falling all over the place. The other step I had trouble with was connecting the assembled wings to the main structure, and it's actually a pretty traditional connection. There's some clips inside there, and they can connect to some modified tiles on the wing. The main problem is that the tolerance on the connection is extremely tight. There's basically no room for error, so if you have something, uh, maybe an older piece or a piece that isn't quite fully connected, then it's just not going to fit. And the clips targeting, uh, the clips have to, to land exactly in place on those modified tiles, or else you'll just be forcing it, the clips could break, etc, etc. So the main problem is the tolerance, and I found that the best way to do this is actually to remove some of these side assemblies here. These are just on 2x4 plates if I recall, 
So you can remove those and get them out of the way. You can make the connection and then you can add all these back in. It's not quite as easy as you might like to, to add them back in, but it's a lot easier than just trying to shove everything into a, a very narrow space. And last but not least, and this is a fairly common thing I found these days, the instructions for attaching these, these edges are pretty simple, but I had a lot of trouble getting these to clip in. This connection in particular is very tight, both on the front and the back, and a lot of times what would happen is I'd secure this one only to hear the back one pop off, and that was on both wings. So definitely pay attention to making sure all the connections are tight. Uh, you want to get these panels in as far as they go, and you don't want them to, to be loose or anything like that. Yeah, but just be aware of that. This TIE Fighter, in my opinion, is going to serve you best as a display piece. It is certainly durable enough to swoosh around lightly, but uh, I pretty much guarantee after you build this model, uh, especially after going through the, the wing process, that you're not going to want to take too many chances with this. Um, I'm a little hesitant to roll this too much just because Again, I don't want the wings to fly off, but it's pretty sturdy. There's not any creaking or anything like that. The grip on the top here with the, the dish piece is maybe a little loose, but that's just because of the, the droid arm connection there. And underneath, there's no appreciable weakness or anything. The side supports the pylons. Those are very strong. Yeah, so overall, it's really not too bad. It's just that it's the risk factor that, that kind of puts me off from wanting to whip this thing around too much. Of course, the model does have some grievals that are pretty obviously fragile, like the cannons, which you've probably seen fall off a couple of times. These daggers on the supports are actually not too delicate, but they can be knocked out of place if you bumped them the wrong way, of course. These diagonal supports that I was talking about on the wings, they're a little bit uh, questionable, they can pop off. Like I said, these are only locked in place in... Well, so going back to the difficulty I had with the, the wing build. So not only are these only locked in place uh, kind of by, if you can see these, these headlight bricks here, the studs on those headlight bricks are supposed to push up against the edge of the hinge brick, so you can see the hinge right here that creates this angle, and that's what holds those in. I found that if you put a one by 2 piece like this, I have a grill tile here, that is a really good way to secure them. But the problem, as you can see on the other side, maybe, if I can give you a better camera angle. Oops. Uh, you can see here that I wasn't able to get the studs all the way under those hinge pieces, so I couldn't add a 1x2 cross piece there. So this is closer to what is specified in the instructions, but um, the tolerances here are such that I wasn't able to achieve that. So you can see that uh, this is a little jiggly here, and on the other three areas where this uh, assembly is repeated, I was able to brace that with a 1x2 piece. But here you have it as the designer intended. Well, not quite as the designer intended. Uh, if I was able to get these studs underneath those hinge places, that would be very secure. Um, I put those 1x2s on the other sub-assemblies just more for peace of mind. But I think it does work, uh, it's just I wasn't able to get it to work in this particular instance. Um, you've also seen the bottom dish pop off a couple of times probably. The instructions do note, or maybe it's the details page, I can't remember. This is actually specified as a traditional 2L tenting axle. Uh, the newer ones have the, the two notches, which is the one you might have if you've got a, a bunch of parts. Fukusaku says that this might uh, increase the friction and make this a little easier to pop off, or sorry, a little harder to pop off. But I didn't actually find that was the case. I think that either way you go, you know, it's gonna be a little bit loose just because there's not a whole lot for any Technic Axle uh, notched or traditional to, to grab onto. This dish does kind of stud into the studs around it here. 
but uh, that's not really going to be the primary point. Uh, that's not where you're getting your clutch strength. So you can bump this bottom dish and it might pop off, but um, pretty easy to put back on. And then last, I'm going to talk about the stand. So the stand is very similar to the interceptor, with the exception of not having the 2x3 brick on the top here. And it studs into, well, as you'd expect, the dish on the bottom here. The issue I have with this is that since it's only a 2x2 connection, you can see this wobbling. And in my opinion, this is a little unstable. And this goes back to what I said about not wanting to take too many chances. There's no axle reinforcement here. So actually a good way to do this might be to have a longer Technic axle uh, pop out of the top here and then use that to kind of secure both the bottom dish and the, the fighter itself to the stand. But as it is right now, it's just a steady connection. It, the balance is okay, just because the TIE Fighter is obviously pretty symmetrical in basically every dimension, but as you can see it wobble. Like, I don't really trust this because there's not a whole lot of play before this thing just tips over and falls off? Question mark? There we go. Also, this might be a me issue. It kind of bends right here, so I think I might need to shove this tank tank axle down a little farther. That's not really the main concern. The main concern is that it's just too much uh, weight on top of too narrow a column. So even the smallest bumps on my table sends this rocking, and I don't really like that. Uh, but the nice thing about the TIE Fighter is that it's got nice flat wings to sit on. So in my opinion, you, know, you don't really need the stand. Um, but of course, if you want to build it and you've got a, a stable place to put it, which admittedly I do not, the stand does look pretty good. Uh, I just think that it might need to be a little bit wider or a little stronger before before I'm willing to, to put this model on it. And I really like this model and I want to keep it and I don't want to rebuild it. So that's why I opt not for the stand. Overall, I really like this TIE Fighter. And while getting the wing sections to come together was a little more frustrating than I would than I would have liked, of course. Um, the wings look really good when they're all assembled. These 1x2 grill tiles are... They just look really, really good. You can see how the, the light hits them. And uh, Fubisaku has a comparison page with the, the film models, I believe. Um, and you can see that he, in my opinion, really nailed it with, uh, with the wings. The sand is a little suspect to me, and as a result, I don't recommend it. Again, mostly because it sits just fine on the wings, and uh, I, you're not going to want to reassemble this if it falls. And with no modifications, like I said, I was getting 5 stores and $231 before shipping and tax, or about $271 including shipping and tax. If you switch out that printed top dish for the plain one, you substitute the less detailed windscreen, you remove the dark red fed pieces, and if you eliminate the stand, I got the total down to 4 stores and $207 before shipping and tax, or about $241 including shipping and tax. And if you put the pieces I recommend buying directly from Pick a Brick, uh, I got a Lego total of $78, which includes the, uh, well, shipping was free, uh, but it includes state tax, which for me in Virginia is about 7%. And then if you run the algorithm on the remaining pieces in BrickLink, I got 4 stores and $91 without shipping and tax, or about $117 with shipping and tax. So then if you add the LEGO Pick a Brick order back in, the parts total was about $195. Instructions for Fukusaku's TIE Fighter cost 11 euro and are available on Rebrickable. Uh, for those of us in the States, this is a pretty good time to be buying things in euro, so that's, that's pretty great. And of course, I'll leave a link to the Rebrickable page in the description, as well as a link to Fukusaku's Flickr page. Thanks as always for watching my review of Fukusaku's TIE Fighter. If you've built this model, you have something to share that I left out, or you have a question about something I didn't cover, please leave them below in the comments. If you've built this model, I'm especially interested to know if you had as much trouble with the wings as I did, or perhaps I missed something completely obvious that would have made my life much easier. Remember to leave the video a like, subscribe to the channel, or follow me on Instagram if you haven't already, and I hope to see you back next time.